Well, good morning. My name is Joey Persuti. I'm one of the pastors here at the Crossing Church, and this is your first time. Thanks for coming and hanging out with us this Lord's Day. It's going to be an interesting service today as I preach on the portrayals of Jesus. So before I do that, I want to go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for what you did for us on the cross. Uh, God, I ask that today be a day that we renew our hearts and minds to you. We be reminded of your grace that you gave to us. Uh, God, we thank you for what you do for us. I uh, ask that you give me the uh, ability to speak into hearts today, that if there is someone here who has not heard heaven's call to become a believer, that God, today be that day. Uh, we thank you for what you do. We thank you for your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Betrayal. It's an interesting thing that almost all of us have at some point been through. Uh, you've either been betrayed or you've betrayed someone, if you're being honest. We've all betrayed someone, but we've definitely all been betrayed. We know what that feeling's like. That The Greek word for it is paradidomai. I've got it broken out on the slide. Uh, para meaning someone close to you, someone that's parallel beside you. In fact, Joe and Jonathan has preached on this before with the parable and with Jesus being beside the boat as the stormy seas were coming. He was parallel with them. He was alongside with them. Uh, Paradidomai, the, the idea that it's someone close to you that you then turn over. That's the didomai part. We know what this feels like. I don't have to explain the definition because it is a heart-wrenching experience to be betrayed. Like you give someone all of your trust, you turn your life to them, you give everything to them, and then they take it and they destroy your life. It's a shock and awe moment. You never expected it to happen. It's unreal. It's tough. And here's the reality of a betrayal. If you've been betrayed, is there a good chance you're going to trust that person in the future? <laughs> no. I mean, they just betrayed your trust. So you're never going to trust them again. Uh, the other implications is that you're never going to uh, think like, like you're going to trust them ever again. You're going to look at them the same. Even if they ask for forgiveness and you forgive someone who betrayed you, what is the likelihood of you ever coming to them again with anything? Nothing, most likely, right, if we're being honest. But also, it's you, your guard's up. You have commitment issues. You start to struggle with how do you trust? If you can't trust this person, how do you trust anyone? I mean, that's what betrayal does to us psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. It has a lasting effect. In fact, as my, my millennial young generation would understand, uh, backstabbed so many times and started walking backwards. It's the idea that you will never be betrayed again. Like, it's not going to happen. You do it once to me, I don't trust anybody anymore. That's like the, realize, you know, the realization of what betrayal feels like. It's tough. You live in fear. So today we're talking about Jesus who's been betrayed. We're going to go through all the betrayals. This is not just Judas. There's something much more going on here. Uh, in Mark 14, so if you don't have a Bible, we've got it on the screens. In Mark 14, verses 43 to 72, we're going to cover it from the ESV. It'll be on the screen. All three other Gospels, so all of the Gospels, mention these portrayals. There's some information missing that I'm going to kind of fill you in uh, with some of the Gospels are missing. But I want you to understand that all the Gospels, this is a big deal. And I think you'll see why pretty soon. So let's begin. Mark 14, 43. <clears throat> and immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came. Now I want you to understand where we were last week. Last week, uh, Judas has already essentially toned, went to the Sanhedrin, and that's the judicial arm of the Jewish people. And he said, listen, I'll give you where Jesus is going to be going because he's been going there before. I've been with him. I'm going to tell you the location he's going to be at. In exchange, you give me some money, three, 30 pieces of silver in fulfillment of the prophecy in Zechariah 13. But not only that, it's about three or four months of wages. So Judas has now told them the location of Jesus, for some, for some couple months of wages, for a little bit of Christmas bonus. He's gotten the money, and now Judas is coming with his posse, his group. And this is what happens. Uh, he comes, and Judas came, one of the twelve, and with 
a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. That's all the Sanhedrin now coming with Judas leading the pack. Now the betrayer, Judas, had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him and lead him away under guard. It's a token, it's a symbol. If I kiss this person, you need to know that that symbol is that's the guy you're looking for. That's Jesus. Ironic, it's a kiss. It's not ironic if you're a rabbi in those days. A rabbi would be greeted with a kiss. That was something you would do with your followers and your pastor or your rabbi. You would give a kiss to your rabbi as a sign of appreciation. But yet, despite the kiss, it now becomes a kiss betrayal. Interestingly enough, in the early church, after these events occur, what does Paul tell his people to do over and over? Give each other kisses of peace. It's not something we do here. It's a little odd, right? It's a little awkward. I've suggested it, and I've always got turned down by the elders. I thought it'd be kind of cool, but it's a little unsanitary, I'm sure. But, but the kiss of peace is the complete opposite of the kiss of betrayal that Judas is going to do. It's a way of showing affection, showing love, showing tenderness to each other, a, a community. And so now the kiss of betrayal has occurred. And if you read John 18, what you know is when Judas comes with his posse, his group, something actually else happens that Mark doesn't tell us about. Um, when it says, the one I will kiss is the man, sees him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. In John, it says, actually, when the the people came, Jesus says, who do you seek? Who do you want? They said, we want Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, and he declares, I am he. The Greek is ego I me. It, It means I am who I am. And you know what the crowd does when they hear I am? They fall to the ground. They can't withstand the majesty of God on earth. And they get back up. I mean, you got to realize a crowd is about a thousand people, we think. You got a thousand people with swords, with lanterns. They're coming to find this Jesus at night. And he tells them, and he says that, and they fall to the ground. And then it keeps going. Judas kisses him. They laid hands on him, and they seize him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest. And cut off his ear. You know who the one is, right? The person who did this. That's Peter. Why is it Peter's name there? Well, John Mark, as we think, is writing directed by Peter. I mean, I don't know about you. I'm not writing my name in when I did something dumb. And Peter's not writing his name. We're telling Mark, don't put that name in there. Don't worry. John tells us that it was Peter. And Peter, the overreactionary, the one who's always super, I'm on board, Jesus. I'm 110%. He can't even cut the guy's neck. He cuts his ear. He's not trained for this. He's not ready. He's not been prepared. So he cuts his ear, and the guy, we we know the guy's name. John tells us his name is Malchus. Not significant other than it was significant enough to remember. That's what names are for, right? You remember these. He cuts his ear off. Does a little cosmetic surgery, and what happens is Jesus gets a little ticked off. He says in the Gospel of John, those He says, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. And this is the best part. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? You know what a legion is? A legion is about five to 6,000 people. I'm not good at math, but I tell you, that's 60 to 70,000 angels that Jesus could just put in a quick submission to the father, and bam, that thousand crowd would all be bound down quickly, but he doesn't. And what's he tell Peter? Peter, you know, feels embarrassed, as I would. And Jesus keeps going. He actually takes the ear and he heals Malchus, uh, one of the servants who's trying to arrest him and he's going to ultimately arrest him. And verse 48 of Mark goes, and Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? He's saying, you guys are coming out as if I've done something wrong. A robber would not have been someone who robbed you. In the the early church, or at least in that time, a robber was an insurrectionist. It It was a terrorist. That's essentially what it was. It was someone who wants to topple the government. They view Jesus in that way. In fact, we know, uh, we know some two things. We know Barabbas was a insurrectionist. You will hear about him soon, eventually, because there was a choice between Barabbas and Jesus, both quote, insurrectionists. One was and the other wasn't. Uh, We also know that um, the Jews would eventually be crucified for their insurrection in AD 70. Remember when I preached on that in Mark 13? 
Uh, he says, you're coming as if I'm trying to take over your government with swords and clubs. And then he says in verse 49, day after day I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. So now you're coming to get me? I was there all the time. You didn't do anything, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And this was all to show ultimately what we're about to see. It's fulfilling God's word. And this is what the psalmist would declare in Psalm 41.9 about Judas. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, Judas was at the Lord's table. He had the Lord's supper. And then he left to go betray Jesus, has lifted his heel against me. Fulfill the scripture of Psalm 41.9. And so now we know that Christ has been portrayed by Judas. Jesus is then taken away. And Judas has got his money. So now we go further in Mark and we see another betrayal occur. Uh, verse 50. And they all left him and fled. Well, who's the they? Those are his people, his apostles, his disciples. They fled away, but we see a young man come up next here in verse 51. And a young man followed him. He's like, I'm going to still do this. I'm sticking with this guy with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. A linen cloth was something expensive. It was a garment. It was like uh, you're going to Nordstrom or you're going to maybe a little bit more expensive. That, that's expensive to me. I'm cheap, so that's probably why. But you're going somewhere really expensive and you buy expensive linen cloth. And he is determined that he's got this linen cloth on and this is what it says. And they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Well, that's humiliating. He was going to follow Jesus, but as soon as they grabbed that linen cloth, he fled. He knew it was serious. Some scholars say that, that this is actually John Mark. This is the gospel writer himself. This is the young man. I'm going to be honest with you. There's no historical data to support that other than the early church thought that. We have no evidence of that. But it would be interesting if it was Mark, right? Because Mark was from his family of wealth. So we think that it could be him. But we don't actually know. And this is where the psalmist would again say, Psalm 88, 18. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. They all left. They fled, including the young man who, who was the last best hope, right? He followed him, but ultimately he left as well. So now we have the betrayal by the young man. So now we get into the Sanhedrin council. This is now that Jesus has been betrayed by Judas. The young man has fled. Now they take Jesus shackled up and they take him to for what's considered to be a trial. Now you guys know what I do for a living. So this is kind of interesting to me. Uh, uh, a Sanhedrin or Jewish trial was there, there's two trials in, in, the, in the gospels. There's the, the religious trial and then there's the Roman trial, the secular trial. There's three parts to each trial. I'm not talking about the, the Roman one today. I, I assume Jonathan may next week, or at least we'll brief, uh, talk about it a little bit. But at least for the Jewish trial, what is about to occur, the Sanhedrin one, there's three parts. There's a hearing before Annas, which we'll talk about, obviously. And then there's a trial before Caiaphas. And then there's ultimately the verdict from the council itself. What I want you to notice as I'm reading through these, and I will not go through the text and pull everything out yet, I want you to notice the irregularities. I want you to, if you think something doesn't seem right in a legal mindset, right, logically, then I want you to pick up on that because this is going to be important later, all right? So verses 53 to 65. And they led Jesus to the high priest. Well, actually, never mind. Let's go to John 18. Sorry, this is where Mark misses this or doesn't add it here. So here's what happens to John 18. Uh, so the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas. For he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Caiaphas is the high priest for the Jewish Sanhedrin. He's the boss of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Annas, Caiaphas knows him because he married his daughter. Annas is the former high priest who got deposed by the, uh, essentially got removed out of uh, position in AD 15 by the Roman government. So now Caiaphas is the high priest, but for some reason they take Jesus to Annas, who's not even in his position anymore. And it says in verse 19 of John 18, the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple 
where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? As, ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, is that how you answer the high priest? It's ironic, because in John 17, the chapter before, it's called the high priestly prayer. It's where the Son of God, who is the high priest, the eternal high priest, prays to the Father for his church. And now we have in John 18, this guy say to Jesus, don't talk to the high priest like that. So verse 23, Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about, what I, about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? So Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So we have John 18, 19 through 24. Oh, excuse me, we'll go to Mark 14 now. So Mark 14, 53, and it continues. And they led Jesus to the high priest, that's Caiaphas. And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. So, so here's what I want you to get, Okay. They're having a trial at night. Should be odd there for you. They're not having a trial which would normally occur in the temple, but they're having it at Caiaphas' house, his crib. That's where they're having this at, all right? And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witnesses against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, uh, I will destroy this temple that it is made with hands, and in three days I will build another, not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up, that's Caiaphas, in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? That's the son of God. They're, they're, the Jews are so afraid to say God's name, they still do this today, that they can't say the name. They say the son of the blessed, which is the son of God. Verse 62, and Jesus said, I am. Another ego, I am me, by the way. I am, and you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments. And he said, what further witnesses do we need? He was stunned by the response. And then he says, 64, uh, you have heard his blasphemy. What uh, is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. So let's go through the irregularities there. Number one, the bias. There's bias that's irregular here. Why is that? Why is Annas involved? <laughs> Annas at that time has massive influence in the Jewish world. Despite the fact he's not even in the position of a high priest, he's the father-in-law of Caiaphas. He goes to Ca uh, Annas first because whatever Annas ultimately says is going to go. He doesn't even have any authority. To the Jewish people, he's a big deal, but legally... In a, in a Jewish religious legal way, he has no authority. So already we see there's a bias there with Annas having massive influence, and he's heavily influencing Caiaphas to make a decision. So whatever Caiaphas ultimately decides will be biased, will not be fair and impartial. Number two, the location. This is supposed to occur in the temple, but it's occurring at Caiaphas' house. That's the courtyard. It's outside this big house. And that's where Peter's hanging out trying to, we'll get to him in a second because he's always messing things up. He's hanging out with all the guys who just arrested Jesus, trying to act like he's one of them. He's not really good at faking it until he makes it. So we'll find out more. But that's the location. Uh, the other one is the day. The Sanhedrin, uh, they cannot meet on a death case or a death penalty case, which is about to occur, right? They're going to pronounce his death. They can't do that on the eve of a Sabbath or on a feast day. Guess what? They did. <laughs> they did. The other regularity, time. This is occurring at night. Is that not odd to you? I mean, we have trials today in courtrooms. Do they occur at night? Why do things occur at night? 
to remain secretive. So no one can see it. So the public can't question them on what they're doing, that they're going against their own laws, their own rules. They're doing this so they, they can't be seen. Next, look at the motive. Their motive is clear. We've got to find witnesses. We've got to pin this on this guy. This guy is getting on our nerves. Our motivation isn't for justice. It's for injustice. They're motivated by evil, by pride, power. Next is the witnesses. According to Deuteronomy 19, Mosaic law is clear. If you have inconsistent witnesses and they cannot say the same thing about a crime, guess what you do? You don't charge the person. Guess what they did? They charged the person. Not only that, when the witness is false, saying something untrue about the, or about the person they're accusing, and then it proves to be false, guess what they do? The person who claim, who, who's a false witness now gets the same crime as a person that they just accused. The same crime. Did you hear anything about that happening? Did anyone else get crucified? Did anyone else get stoned? Nope. So now we have irregularities with the witnesses. Notice they didn't ask about character witnesses, which is important today in, in, in legal courts, right? Uh, character witnesses, how, how do you have someone t testify about your character? They could have asked the apostles, they fled. They could have asked about disciples. I mean, Peter's over there hanging out by the fire, getting warm, trying to act like he's cool. They didn't ask about those. The other one to look at is the evidence. Here's what their evidence was. Verse 58 says, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. They're saying, Jesus, you said that. That's our evidence. You said that. Is that true? According to John 2.19, that's actually false. John 2.19 says this. Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Who's destroying the temple? It's the Jews. It's funny how you change evidence, right, to suit your need. It's the Jews, he's saying, that are going to destroy the temple. It's he who's going to raise the temple up, his temple being his body, and then all of God's people will reside with God, having eternal presence in God's glory through his body, which is going to be the temple. But the evidence is false. The verdict. The verdict ultimately is, is that it's death by stoning. Under Mosaic law, when you commit blasphemy, if you declare yourself to be God, you declare yourself to be I am, and you're charged with blasphemy. You know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to be stoned. It's Leviticus 24. You're supposed to be stoned. Were they, was he stoned? We know how he dies. So spoiler there, right? He's not stoned. In fact, he turns them over. They turn him over to Rome in Mark 15, 1. Also, the death penalty could not be declared as a verdict on the same day of the trial, which is what they just did. And lastly, the treatment. They struck Jesus. Matthew says they spit in his face and slap him. They mock him repeatedly. Let me just tell you something from experience. If this were to happen in this county or in this country or in this state, this would have all been a mistrial. On one of these irregularities, I could file a, I could file a motion to the appeal, appellate court, get it appealed, and that person would be off the hook. Because this is how evil this is. Every one of these irregularities is in on its face, prima facie as they say, right? In on its face, showing just how unjust Christ's trial was. In our own system of government, we can never handle this because we have so many protections against this kind of thing. Just the treatment of the victim, not the victim, of the quote criminal in of itself is sufficient to remove the charge placed against him. But what was Jesus' response? Despite all the irregularities, he didn't call his attorney up. He didn't call up uh, any organization up. He didn't ask for anything to be changed on his behalf to make himself a little bit better so he didn't have to deal with it. Isaiah 53, 7 says this, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So now Jesus has not only been portrayed by Judas, the young man, but now by religion itself. We'll explain more later. Lastly, we got to get to our boy Peter. So Peter, Mark 14, 
66 through 72. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, Caiaphas' house, hanging on the outskirts, maybe having a s'mores by the campfire, who knows? He's just trying to fit in. One of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, um, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus. What's his first denial says? But he denied it, saying, I neither know or, nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway and the rooster crowed. Verse 69, and the servant girl saw him and began to say to the bystanders, this man is one of him, uh, one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders uh, again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them for you are a Galilean. Now here's what you have to understand. Uh, you are now in Judea. It's a county, right? And, and Galilee is a county. Peter doesn't talk like other people in this county right now. You know what I mean? You, you're from the South. Go, go to Miami and come back to Jacksonville. I think we agree. We're both, both Floridians, but we don't talk the same, right? We don't have the same accents. Peter's got an accent problem. He can deny all he wants, but guess how he talks? He talks like a Galilean. He is out of his element. In fact, even the Greek says this, and it doesn't say this in the English version, but the Greek even says, and his speech agrees with it, meaning that he's speaking like a Galilean. He cannot get out of this. But what does he say in verse 71? In response to him being a Galilean. But he again, but he began to evoke a curse on himself and to swear. I do not know this man of whom you speak. That was the third denial. As promised by Christ, what happens to 72? And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. This weeping is not some reaction to a romantic chick flick, okay? This Greek is like he's wailing uncontrollably in anguish. He just realized what he did. He just realized he became part of the plan. And he said, what did he say before? Mark 14, 31. If I must die with you, I will not deny you. That was what Peter says before all this. And guess what? Not only him, and they all said the same according to Mark. He wasn't the only one who would ultimately promise, I'll never deny you, Jesus. And that's significant because in this, it's not just Peter's betrayal. It's the church's betrayal because Peter is a representative of the church. He is the leader of the pact to many extent. We'll talk about it later again. But, but this is important because in Zechariah 13, 7, it says, Strike the shepherd and the sheep. That's the church. That's the flock that God, that Christ had in his, in his midst. They will be scattered. And so now we have the betrayal by Peter in addition to all the other betrayals. Despite all that Christ did for him, we have them all betrayal. But here, here's what we have to see. This is where it's important for us. And this is going to be tough. So get ready. In the betrayals of Jesus we see ourselves portraying Jesus. Interesting. I talk to my wife. I usually, she's my, my, my best critic in, in a good way. And I tell her, say, hey, I have an idea for a sermon. And she's like, that's not a good idea. Don't do it. I'm like, all right, I won't do it. I had an idea. I'm going to make the argument Judas is no different than us. And she says, well, that's kind of a stretch. I mean, I've never done that. I said, oh, I don't think I've ever sold someone out for 30 pieces of silver. You're right. You're right. Fair enough. But let me, let me make an argument for you, if you will. Uh, the more serious we view sin, the more maze will be of God's grace. So we have to look at our own sins and the sins of others to fully appreciate what God did in his grace to us. We look at Judas today with such disdain, right? Like we see him and we're like, man, we would have never done that. The simple reality is we're no different. We have portrayed a holy and just God. We have exchanged God for someone or something in our life. We have done things just like Judas. We have played the part, right? At the end of the day, we've all portrayed God in the same way. It's starting back from Genesis 3 where Adam and Eve portray God. They portray his trust. He gives them something, a commandment. And they take it and they break it. 
That's betrayal. That, that's, that's the gut reaction we have when, it, when something's done to us. We, we now understand that what Judas does to Christ, we've done that before. So we need to see ourselves in Judas. But in, in the young man's betrayal, we see ourselves again. We're willing to discard things that are most precious to us and run away naked in fear and in humiliation. Our sin is exposed to this world. Our cowardice is exposed, and we're willing to lose everything possible to avoid being identified with Jesus, just like the young man. Let's be honest. We want the label. We don't want the struggle. That's the young man. He said, listen, they all fled. I'm sticking with them. And then they took his cloak. He said, I'm out. I'll go naked. I don't care. Imagine that rumor story of how many Facebook posts he got, how many Instagram shares they got of him running around naked in the town, right? Right? But we've done that. We're willing to give up everything we can so we can avoid an identity. So we portray God in the same way. And then we see religion's portrayal. And this is the best part. I, I, this just blows me away. Uh, and all their irregularities, you realize that they created this whole system to begin with. Uh, they are the ones that created the traditions and the phony rules to make themselves feel justified and righteous. And yet, even when they created these things, they couldn't even keep it. They had to bend their own rules to accommodate their own sin. And that's what sinful natures do. They adapt to sin really easy. And so, what have we done? We've created our own rules. We've created our own barriers. Instead of having a relationship with God, we would rather trust in religion, trust in the check, you know, check boxes, the, the lists, thinking that that in of itself would save us. But in the meantime, we're trying to constantly bend it to make it work for us, where we have to ultimately say, man, there is nothing I can do to come to a holy and just God based on what I can produce. And the Sanhedrin does exactly that. They show that in breaking their own law and their own commandments, their own traditions, their own rules, how desperate they need God. And then Peter's betrayal, I think is the most recognizable for us. He has his, te- his faith put on a test. It, 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 he fails miserably. Uh, he's chopping people's ears off, doing cosmetic surgery. Like, it, it, and, and today, uh, we like to tell ourselves we would new, never do what Peter would do. You think, you think that's right? We, we would never deny Christ? We wouldn't deny by how we live. We wouldn't deny by what we say. We wouldn't deny him by what we don't say. We wouldn't deny him by what we post on social media. Really? You don't think we would deny Christ like Peter did? I mean, Peter's just doing a 2,000-year-old thing that we do today. I mean, we all do it. I do it. Uh, We've denied him to fit in. And that's where Peter gets so close to us because we see that we know what God does with Peter later. So in exchange for eternity, we would have taken the 30 pieces of silver. In exchange for joy, we would have taken the temporary happiness. In exchange for authentic community, we would have socialized with the imposters making s'mores by the fire. That's what we would have done. In exchange for a relationship, we would have wanted a religion that would have accommodated our sin. You know people like that. They go to a religious environment that suits them where they're at. Let me tell you something, that's not a religion you want, or you should want. If you start lowering God's standards, good luck, because you can. And this is where I want you not to be depressed for a second, okay? Because I I realize I'm a little depressed. Uh, When we see ourselves in these betrayals, what is our immediate reaction? We go to the cross where grace is eternally overflowing, and it's supplying all our needs, all our deficiencies, and all of our betrayals. And that's why, number two... In the betrayals of Jesus, we see God's grace. Did you know that a betrayal is only as good as what you know? If I knew someone was going to betray me, guess what I'm not going to do? Trust them. Right? You know, Jesus knows Judas is about to betray him. That's what it says over and over in the Gospels. I know he's about to betray me. It's coming. But yet he does it anyways. Despite Jesus having the knowledge of Judas is going to betray him, guess what he does? He gives him a seat at the Lord's table. He becomes the CFO, accountant, treasurer of the the, the apostles' groups. Uh, He allows Judas to see all the miracles. He's heard about the transfiguration, God's maximum glory in Christ. He's even participated in all of these things. He's seen it. 
He's felt it. But how is that not different than us? Despite knowing what we would do, God still loved us to give us grace. He gave us a seat at the Lord's table. He still gave us a chance to mess it up and then to guess what? Fix it. And that's the beauty of the grace with Judas. Is that while that ended totally differently, and you can read about that, he, 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 attempt, he commits suicide. He dies. He grieves and gets upset once he realizes what he's done. But God gives us grace in knowing the fact that we will portray him anyways. The young man's portrayal, we see that God's grace in there is despite our nakedness and public exposure of our sin, Jesus has clothed us, swaddled us, wrapped us in his eternal righteousness. So that when God sees us, he doesn't see a naked man running away afraid. He sees his son. He sees his son. He sees me clothed in his son. And this is where it gets even better because if it is true that this young man is really Mark and he ran away naked, God still gives naked man second chances because we're reading from Mark, right? That's, that's reckless grace. Uh, religion's betrayal. Instead of finding God in a building, in a temple, we can directly access the Father anywhere. Instead of all these religious things we created and we have created, instead of trying to create all these rules to live and justify our own worth, God's grace has satisfied those rules and then gave us access to him. A relationship with God is more authentic and real than any other religion, whatever it could produce, whatever it makes you feel. I've had people once tell me, man, I go to church on Sunday because it makes me feel good. I said, what do you do with Monday through Saturday? Because I want to feel good all the time. I mean, you got to do church every day? That's where the relationship comes in. The Jews would love that, right? Like they would go Saturday and do their thing and they feel good all week because that's how arrogant they are. But the reality is, is a, God, a relationship with God should give us joy every day. It should give us, allow us to go with him, to him for anything we need. And then lastly, we see that Peter's betrayal shows God's grace in a mighty way. Uh, despite Peter denying Christ three times, despite what Mark 8.38 says, where Jesus says, if anyone's ashamed of me in this adulterous and sinful generation, so will the Son of Man be ashamed of him. Despite that, Peter is the first to run with the news of the Lord's resurrection. It's Peter who's the one who preaches the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, the first sermon that leads thousands of people to get saved. It's Peter who would be the representation of the early church. He is the early church. That's how early church uh, fathers looked at him. It is Peter, again, who would be founder of the Roman church, like the church of Rome that Romans is written to. It's the largest, second largest church in that time. It, he has a huge role. It would be Peter who would be one of the three pillars of the church, according to Galatians. And it would be Peter, despite his denials, who would be ultimately crucified upside down because he did not want to take the glory that Christ had by being crucified upright. God gives second chances to people like Peter and people like us. So stop beating yourself up. Stop worrying about how much you've portrayed God and start recognizing his grace that God has a lot he wants to do with you, that he ain't done with you yet. Because it is when we find out when, when Christ says that one day, Peter, you're going to fall away and then you're going to come back and then I want you to strengthen your brothers. I want you to strengthen people around you because you've recognized your portrayal. You've come back to me and now I want you to feed my church. He says, over time, feed my sheep. And that is the beauty of God's grace with the betrayals. So I want to say this. In the moments that we have in our life when we're, when we're portrayed, uh, instead of uh, worrying about the trust issues you now have, because I've had those, instead of worrying about commitment issues, what you do is you keep instilling trust, trusting in God's grace, knowing that he is sovereign over all things and all things will work out to his glory. And not only that, but when you've portrayed someone, because I know you have, especially God, we could put him at the top, but everyone else, you recognize that you're contrite, you're remorseful, you weep like Peter wept, you realize, man, I made a mistake, 
but you don't sit in your depression, but you get up. By God's grace, you move forward. You continue to love others. You continue to serve others and continue to remind yourself every day of God's unending grace for you. Let's pray.